Coast Guard Station, Fairport, Ohio, to Commander Coast Guard Group in Detroit. Unidentifiable flying objects quarter mile east of CEI power plant. At 2035, this station received a call reporting a large object hovering over the lake and apparently on a slow descent. White light a quarter mile up. This unit sent two crew members to investigate. Before they arrived on scene, we received two more calls reporting the object had dispersed three to five smaller flying objects that were zipping around rather quickly. These objects had red, green, white, and yellow lights that strobed intermittently. They also had the ability to stop and hover in mid-flight. That was a real memo from Coast Guard officials on Lake Erie, just down the road from the Perry Nuclear Facility. The unidentified objects appeared to be scouting the area, it wrote. Widely documented is the connection between UFOs and nuclear weapons. But lesser known is the correlation between strange encounters and nuclear power plants. We cover strange declassified files. Subscribe to join us. March 4th, 1988. Sheila Baker and her children are driving home along Lake Erie. At 6.30 p.m., they notice a large egg-shaped object hovering above the lake, which is covered in ice. Once home, Sheila asks her husband Henry to go back with them to see the UFO. They return and watch it from the beach. It's rocking from end to end, making no sound, and slowly moving downward toward the ice. This was too much for the Bakers. They returned home and called the nearby Coast Guard station. As they drove to the scene, officials received two more calls the egg was dispersing smaller UFOs that were swarming around it and performing odd maneuvers like coming to a stop in mid-flight. Some made passes near the Perry nuclear plant. The officials arrived. Their account begins. The ice was cracking and moving abnormal amounts as the object came close to it. It was rumbling and the object lit multicolored lights at each end as it apparently landed. The lights on it went out momentarily and then came on again. They went out again and the rumbling stopped and the ice stopped moving. The smaller objects began hovering in the area where the large object landed, and after a few minutes, they began flying around again. Mobile 2 reported they appeared to be scouting the area. He also reported one object moving toward them at a high speed and low to the ice. Mobile 2 backed down the hill they had been on, and when they went back, the object was gone. Another of the small objects turned on a spotlight where the large object had been, but Mobile 2 couldn't see it. And then the object disappeared. Another approached Mobile 2 500 yards offshore, 20 feet above the ice. It began moving closer. Mobile 2 began flashing his car's headlights and the object moved off to the west. The crew couldn't identify what the objects were. And neither could local police or airports in the area. The Coast Guard officials were recalled and it was over. Audio of their communications has not been released. But we have other accounts of strange encounters near nuclear facilities. Cooper Nuclear Station, East Nebraska. Declassified records from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission show in 2010, a former security officer claims a UFO violated the station's protected area some 20 years earlier. It wasn't reported at the time. Between 1986 and 89, the file says, the officer observed an unidentified triangle fly down the Missouri River at an altitude of just 150 feet toward the station. When it arrived, it stopped and began to hover in front of a water intake. He called over a colleague, and together they watched the UFO for a few minutes before it turned and went back up the river. The next night, it returned. This time, he noticed the triangle had a circle of rotating lights on its underside. Again, it hovered over the protected area. It made no noise and was a third the size of the reactor building. After a few minutes, it turned and went back up the river north. The officer told regulators the UFO should have been reported, but it wasn't. A review classifies the safety significance of this sighting as normal. And in a letter to the officer, the NRC thanks him for his report and says it will take no additional action beyond informing Cooper of the 20-year-old event. There were more encounters near power plants in the late 80s, too. Buried in the hotline recordings of the National UFO Reporting Center, 
is a caller who claimed to work at the Humboldt Bay facility near Eureka, California. I did see a very strange current at or about Singley Road, the south exit to US 101. I first noticed this physical phenomenon at Alton, and it seemed to be somewhere close to Ferndale, California. It gave the appearance of a localized source which emanated columns of darkness. Above this phenomenon, there hovered a bright white aircraft of some sort having lateral wings. And I, I made a little picture of it. There's also, a, like I said, there was five of us on the way to work that saw, it, saw this thing, and they, they would be willing to, well, several of them would be willing to, you know, testify to that fact also. Okay, was that a bright white object stationary? Yes, it was. And it remained stationary while these shafts of light were coming down, or black light were coming down. No, they weren't coming down from the craft. They were, the light, the, the black shafts of light were coming from the ground beneath it. Oh, I see. Okay. A local light source beneath it, directly beneath it. Okay. And these black shafts were going off at an oblique angle, maybe 45 degrees, all over. In fact, they're varying angles. And I saw the most. Most everybody else saw only two uh, shafts coming, dark shafts coming from it. It was like they were plastic columns. They were laser sharp, straight to the point source. It seemed like like a regular beam. Then they were beams. They were okay. they were like laser beams, and they were they were like if I if you can imagine it, uh, plastic tubes filled with smoke because they were actually dark. They were actually blocking light that was behind them. Okay. A year earlier, a caller in Toms River, New Jersey, called the hotline about seeing a triangular craft 10 miles north of the Oyster Creek Generating Station. UFO Reporting Center? Yes. Um, I live in um, New Jersey, Toms River, New Jersey. Yes. And on Thursday night between 8, 8 and 8.30, I reported to the um, Toms River Police Department that I had, I had seen something in the sky that was extremely unusual. It was um, extremely big. It had um, fire engine red lights, um, Kelly green lights, orange lights. It would shut all them lights down and turn it bright white. It had no destination at all. It was, it was zigzagging in and out. It was shooting from one side of the sky to the other side. It was almost as if it was rolling. Then it came back into like almost by the highway and it was coming down low and as I got a good look at it it was triangular shape and I rolled the window down and there was ex no sound to the thing at all the lights were um, extremely extremely big 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 lights okay was this a, a large object or small? A very large object okay. unbelievably large Okay, could you estimate its size by comparing it with something you know of? <laughs> this would make you laugh, but it was as big as a 7-Eleven store. I don't know if you're familiar with okay. that. It was as, it was as big as a, like a little convenience store. So how common are these encounters? The Air Force's Project Blue Book tells us this was happening as far back as 1952. That May, Four employees at the Savannah River plant in Ellington, South Carolina, saw eight 15-inch-wide golden disks silently approach the plant. The final object flew so low it showed situational awareness to rise above storage tanks. The FBI interviewed the witnesses before quickly closing the investigation. Blue Book categorized the event as unknown. Fourteen years later, three friends were fishing on the Hudson River near the Indian Point Nuclear Station in New York. Suddenly to the north, a bronze object appeared, shaped like a disc with a dome in the middle. It wobbled before going behind a hill. They took four photos, all of which were sent to Blue Book, who quickly called it a hoax. Advisor to the project, J. Allen Hynek, however, wrote the USAF from his office at Northwestern University a year later. I find no substantiation for the evaluation of a hoax, he said, citing a photo analysis conducted at Wright-Patterson. The photographs appear genuine, and the witness was reliable, he added. Hynek lobbied Blue Book to change the case's status from hoax to unidentified, but they didn't listen. We have two questions after going through these accounts. Why were the incursions happening? And do they still occur today? 
In 2014, France's Secretariat General for National Defense published a press release disclosing that the country's nuclear installations continually experience overflights from unidentified drones. They did not pose a threat, it said. Nevertheless, the French government launched an R&D project to detect and intercept them. Soon after, a director at a plant near Bly told reporters he didn't believe what flew over his site was a drone. We saw a UFO, he said, but there was no impact on the safety of our sites. On June 17th of this year, the U.S. Senate Intel Committee called for federal agencies to come together and produce a joint report on unidentified aerial phenomena, unclassified. Included in the request is a previously unknown FBI dataset of UAP encounters over restricted U.S. airspace. Speaking to us on Twitter, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence Chris Mellon, now with To The Stars Academy, said the following, We know the FBI has investigated numerous domestic UAP cases. UAP intrusions over federal facilities are one example. It remains to be seen if this database will include more recent incursions over nuclear plants. But, given the history, we wouldn't be surprised. As for the why of the question, why are anomalous objects interested in these sites? We don't know. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. And special thank you to our Patreon supporters, including John M. If you like what we do, consider joining them on Patreon and help us produce one new episode every week. Also, most of our traffic comes from external shares, so if you have any family or friends interested in this topic, we'd appreciate it if you asked them to subscribe. Thanks guys, see you next time.